Am I Shri P K Sena ji? My seniors, colleagues, friends, today here, as well as those who have joined us from various locations across NTPC, and a very super hearty welcome and good morning to Professor Jagdish Shet, the star and speaker for the day, and Shri Jayant Shah, the sarthi, the coordinator. You've been extremely generous to have made today's event possible for us. The eminent speaker series, as we all know, is a much appreciated L&D initiative of NTPC PMI, wherein we invite eminent personalities from India and abroad for talks and for sharing their ideas in the field of strategy, management, and leadership. It is wonderful to know that the entire NTPC fraternity has been benefiting and learning from the series. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce to you the speaker today. Professor Jagdish Shet is the Charles H. Kelstorp Professor of Marketing at the Goizueta Business School of Emory University, the United States. He has over 50 years of combined experience in teaching and research at the University of Southern California, the University of Illinois, Columbia University, MIT, and Emory University. Back in the home country, he was one of the prominent members of the core team during the initial years of Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. He is known nationally and internationally for his scholarly contributions in consumer behavior, relationship marketing, competitive strategy, and geopolitical analysis. Throughout his career, Professor Shait has offered hundreds of presentations in over 20 countries. His list of accolades is so long, but I need to mention a few of them. He's been awarded with Outstanding Marketing Educator Award, which is presented by Academy of Marketing Science. The Outstanding Educator Award, twice presented by Sales and Marketing Executives International, and all the top four awards given by American Marketing Association. May I name them? The Richard D. Irwin Distinguished uh, Marketing Educator Award, the Charles Coolidge Parlin Award, the P.D. Converse Award, and the William Wilkie Award. He has published more than 300 research papers and 30 books on various disciplines and topics. Prominent books that deserve a mention are Clients for Life, Tectonic Shift, Firms of Endearment, Chindia Rising, The Four A's of Marketing, Breakout Strategies for Emerging Markets, the most recent one, The Sustainability Edge and the Self-Destructive Habits of Good Companies, which is the book on which his talk for today is based. May I now request the speaker, Dr. Shape, to kindly come up on stage, and I would also invite the head of NTPC uh, uh, PMI family, D.S. Rouser and P.K. Sinar, sir, to kindly come up on stage and uh, felicitate Dr. Shape with our token of appreciation. So how are we going to do it? Absolutely the Indian way. Oh. <laughs> I'd request uh, Rao sir and P.K. Sina sir to felicitate him with a shawl. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing the honor, sir. And I know all of you cannot wait to hear the talk. I would request the IT team to kindly do uh, uh, help Dr. Shade with caller mic. GM, General Motors, Ford, AT&T, Sears, Firestone, Digital, Kodak. Once upon a time, they were riding high, the exemplars of business excellence. And then? What happened? A disaster. Is any company headed for the same fate? Is our company headed for the same fate? How do we know? How do we change course? Let's find out. Let's shine a light on the dark places in our business. Let's uncover our self-destructive habits before they destroy us. Ladies and gentlemen, let us hear from the expert himself 
Dr. Jagdish Shade, on the topic, Self-Destructive Habits of Good Companies. Good morning. Good morning. Is it a morning or afternoon? Morning. Still morning, right? Okay. Uh, my style is totally conversational, and usually I start about my name. Jagdish is easy to pronounce, easy to write for us. I went to the States in 1961 as a foreign graduate student. 1963, I became a professor at Columbia University in New York. And all my colleagues were non-Indians. They did not know how to pronounce our names in those days. And one of my colleagues said, we don't know how to pronounce Yagdish, Jagdish, so we'll call you Jag as in Jaguar. <laughs> and ever since that association, I've been dreaming of owning a Jaguar with a license plate, Jag's Jag, why not? And the dream became a reality 20 years ago when I turned 60. I'm 80 now. Do I look 80? Do I look 80? That's because I'm in marketing. <laughs> First thing in marketing we learn, it's all about packaging, right? <laughs> Aging ingredient, fresher the package, right, pretty much. A true story, I have two grown-up children. They are in their 50s now. So 20 years ago, they surprised me on my birthday. I don't count my birthday. Actually, I'm a refugee from Burma before World War II when Japan rolled over Burma. We were Indian community, we had to flee. And uh, so I don't count my birthdays. So I went out to get my local paper and saw this beautiful Jaguar XJ model, which is the top of the line. Even the color I like, parked in the driveway, with a handwritten license plate, Jags Jag, happy 60th birthday. It turned out to be a rental car. <laughs> so I'm still looking for my Jaguar, okay? <laughs> and anybody can adopt me as a parent, grandparent, I don't care, you know, pretty much. Uh, now here's the irony, Jaguar was the official car of the almighty British Empire. And today, that brand is owned by Tata Motors, a former colony. This is the change. 25 years ago, if you had told anybody that Tata Motors will own Jaguar and Land Rover brands, we think we are dreaming or it's a mirage. Today, Aditya Birla Group from here owns a company in Atlanta-based company in America called Novellis which is the largest aluminum sheet aluminum producer which goes into making packages like beverage cans, beer cans, etc. Aerospace industry, mind-boggling. And the reverse is happening. In India, you can see now global competition. So today, it is not just limited to Indian companies competing with Indian companies, but in the appliance, white goods business, Korean companies dominate here, LG for example, or Samsung. Cell phones are all made by Chinese now more and more. Japanese have already exited the cell phone business, handheld devices. Korean Samsung dominates, but it is not having the monopoly as it should have. And today everybody's watching uh, products made out of China to come here. Whether it's a Huawei handheld device I'm talking about, as opposed to infrastructure, radical changes. You see similar radical changes in governments. All over Europe there is a huge movement toward populism. Existing government is, nobody is happy with them, they want to throw them out or have street demonstrations. And that's work I do quite a lot now, geopolitical work and impact, because all of this risks the enterprises. Policy changes, regulatory uncertainty. We don't know in America today with the new government what will be the next tweet <laughs> and its impact not only on the stock market but everybody is nervous. What is the next thing on his mind? Think about that. 
That's the world we are living in. So this book was written some time ago, and that's based upon the most insightful question I have been ever asked by any chairman of a large enterprise. He was a group CEO of a large telecom company, about $30 billion, one of those baby bells. And in one-on-one -on -one conversation where you are mentoring, coaching, giving advice, very confidential, he said, Jag, do you know why good companies fail? And I thought, companies never fail. This is what I was taught, and this is what I taught. Humans are mortal, institutions are immortal. He said, look, when I was head of the core business, which is the telephone landline, like a BSNL type, large, very large, I was very happy with a book called In Search of Excellence, Four companies I identified that I can role model to move my company into the future, IBM, for its excellence in technology and customer relationship, Xerox, again, brilliant company in terms of technology, Kodak for branding, and Sears for retailing. And so we don't think that generally a telephone company would be the best retailer because everybody is their customer. Or your customers who are electric boards, they're everywhere. And often they have a monopoly in that municipality or territory, but they've never thought themselves as retailers. So he was a very interesting person, very thoughtful. And he said, Jack, these four companies were my heroes. I wanted to transition not only my culture, but systems, processes, emulating from this best practices. And then six, seven years later, when he became the group chairman, he found all of them were in serious trouble. IBM was languishing. They even had to bring an outside CEO who had no experience with technology whatsoever. He came from packaged goods industry, consumer FMCG, and he turned around. Insider could not do it. Xerox is still languishing. They have not been able to diversify from their core product, which was the duplicating machines, which they were very good. That is now replaced by the Japanese guys who actually dominate that market. And they thought we would become a digital document company, which is the right thing to do because you copy, you have the images, you digitize the whole thing, and you become a document company, which they are trying, surviving, but people see no real future of that company. Kodak is gone, because Kodak was actually pioneer of the digital camera technology, but your whole film people are so important in cash flow, you are unable to make the change. You pioneer a technology, and competition takes over. Japanese decided they will bet on the digital cameras, took the market out completely. Today, there are no American digital camera makers whatsoever. This is the story in America, and Sears just went into chapter 11, one of the best retailers in the world ever, like Marks and Spencer, which is still alive, which is fascinating. So this is the question he asked me. And I said, it's such an exciting problem. Let me take time out to do research myself and I'll come back a few years later to give you the answer. I have no idea. And that led to this journey about why good companies fail. And that gives you absolutely startling reasons and examples. So my title of the presentation should be, could have been, the book title also, Seven Bad Habits of Good Companies. But I couldn't do it because there is an excellent book called The Seven Good Habits of Effective People. And my publisher did not want to have any litigation with the other publisher. So I changed the title at the end. But I'm very serious about the seven bad habits of good companies. And that will be the presentation. So let me show you where we are going. This is the most insightful question. This is the In Search of Excellence book, which is where he began to raise me the question. There is another book which has sold millions of copies, Good to Great. How many of you know that book? 
mandatory reading today in any management class. Uh, Jim Collins is a brilliant, brilliant researcher. And he started by looking at companies that deliver better financial returns, earnings growth, and therefore dividend policy, etc. And once he found out those companies, he said, what is unique about those companies? Some of those companies are also in serious trouble now. He has abandoned that platform. In fact, he's writing more about why good companies fail. So this has become a very important area. The book was published just before the economic recession, which created more like a storm that came in and victories were total fallen. This book called The Self-Destructive Habits of Good Companies and How to Break Them is now in 14 languages. It has struck a chord. I found myself, it's very fascinating when I go to the university presidents or chancellors and talk to them about this book. They say, can you write a book about why good universities fail? <laughs> it's a platform as we call it, right? We almost wrote a book why great Japanese corporations have failed. Think about it. Hitachi is on its way breaking up. Sony is struggling to survive. These are the icon of Japan. We had great companies in India, mostly in Calcutta at that time, before we shifted to Delhi or Bombay. Metal Box. How many of you remember Metal Box? You are too young, probably. One of the best companies. Indian Oxygen. And interestingly, many private sector companies have come and gone. State enterprises like yours have survived. I'm very fond of public or state enterprises. They are unsung heroes of every nation, including India or China. Chinese have been able to migrate the state enterprises into truly global multinational corporations. So their journey is to become global. They want to be another Japan or another Korea in the process. So if you take companies like Huawei, if you take companies like Lenovo, how many of you know Lenovo? Almost number one toppling HP on the PC side, or Dell Computers, for example. If you take higher in appliances, I was the advisor to Whirlpool Corporation, which we have survived, brought them to India. We bought the Kelvinator on the refrigerator side. Today, we watch primarily higher corporation from China, not Electrolux from Europe, for example, General Electric is already gone in appliances business. And it is so painful to see today an icon company like General Electric in the verge of almost disinvestment in many ways by breaking up the pieces. What was created as a great enterprise with huge diversification is in serious trouble. So even good to great book does not sound right. So that's kind of a leadership, level five leadership, etc., makes no sense. One third of the companies listed in the 1970 Fortune 500 have vanished by 1983. First energy crisis of 74, 78, that storm wiped out a bunch of companies. Private equity took over. Warren Buffett became a multi-billionaire. KKR, all private equity guys came in. And right now, the same phenomenon is likely to happen for the next decade. But this time, it would be Blackstone rather than a Goldman Sachs leading the world. Just watch that. The average corporate life expectancy in Japan and Europe is 12, 12 and a half years. Big companies. That was unthinkable. They are zaibastos. They are national treasures. Government has to support them because they are the ones who create economic livelihood, employment, everything. It's like a social agenda built into an enterprise in some fashion. But life expectancy is only 12 and a half years. Corporate life expectancy declined from 45 years to 18 years in Germany with the European Union that was came in. That was a big change. And uh, from 13 to 9 years in France. France tries to survive their enterprises a little more because they have some state ownership behind, minorities, quite a few of them. They're very clever about this thing. And from 10 years, to four years in the UK. So if you take the foot, if you take the foot.
you take the FTSE as an index, the top 500 corporations, there are very few owned by the British. All of them are owned by foreign multinationals. Isn't that a change? So this is what, and I won't belabor the point, but get to the seven bad habits in a moment. While it is predictable, because there are theories in management where we say it's life and death. You are born, and therefore you have to die. But you have companies that have survived 500 years, which means that doesn't sound right, because there are so many exceptions to this prevailing theory. So we ruled out that thing. Good companies fail when they are either unable or unwilling to change. That's the fundamental message from all this research. So in the case of uh, unwilling to change, here is a world-class company called Digital Corporation, absolutely the competitor to IBM, succeeding anything, founded by a brilliant scientist from MIT, a PhD, who felt that the future is in the computer business, but at affordable prices. Here comes the PC revolution. He that believes that PC is a toy, will can never do the job of the mainframe computers. Or today, cloud computing can do the work of a legacy systems. So IBM is struggling in that transition. He actually was so laughing at the Microsoft PC revolution that he invested heavily into supercomputing on the other side. For 24, 25 years, his management was telling him, actually outside advisors saying, shift toward the PC-oriented approach. Take a lead there because you are very good. Go into services. He refused to listen. So and a dogma that you have creates an unwillingness to change. And the dogma came. This is the only company I know, multi-billion dollar, where the founder destroys the company on his way out rather than the next generation of successors in the family or whatever it is. Fascinating. And IBM opposite, unable to change. They knew they had to change, but the culture, the system, the processes had taken over. So internal chairman, last one was uh, John Akers is my name. I interviewed him. He actually saying, I have lost control of my own position moving the company. I cannot move the company. That's the most damning statement a leader can make, that he is unable to change the company, given the leadership position. Isn't that interesting? And that's why they brought an outsider. The board decided time has come to bring about a change in outsider. And Lou Gerstner revitalized the company. Sampal Misana was the next chairman who did a fantastic job other 15, 20 years of life. Now they're struggling back again, pretty much, which is interesting. So, so that's one thing that I find fascinating. So unable to change, unwilling to change, and more recent examples are GE is unable to change. And in my analysis, I find that we often say it's a culture problem, which I don't agree. The most moldable resource is not agricultural commodity like a wheat from which I can make chapati or I can make bread or anything, or an industrial raw material which is a limit to what I can mold it into something else like a pharma raw material I can make into an agricultural pharma to some extent. Most moldable and versatile resource are human beings, which is culture. I can mold them if I know how to do it. It's that simple. So I've never agreed with the way that biggest resistance is culture. Biggest problem in change with large enterprises is processes you have put in place. Order taking process, payment process, manufacturing process, whatever it is. So processes are the biggest shackles company puts on itself as it organizes, not the people. Which is why people from outside, when they come, are able to re-motivate the people, re-energize them. So I think we need to understand where the change can be made. And sometimes it has to do with the systems. You are locked into a system which is a huge infrastructure investment, and you are not able to change that in time. So you have to gain time, essentially, which is fascinating. So, 
So many good companies fail to adapt because they have developed several bad habits over time. So what are those bad habits? There is no priority among the seven that I will show you. I have my preference, which one I like it more than others. But these are the seven I discovered through research of hundreds and hundreds of companies, mostly archival research or secondary research. And here are the seven habits. My favorite is denial of new reality. Companies believe they will be OK. If it worked in the past, it will continue to work in the future. They don't realize that they are an element in an ecosystem. And if the ecosystem gets polluted or disturbed or disrupted, and the biggest disruptions are three today. One is technology itself, rapidly changing. Everything that was very well done in electromechanical today sounds like dumb technology. So everybody's trying to make electromechanical devices smart. Energy generation is dumb. I've done work for at least half a dozen large energy power companies in America. And I've done work for ION, which is a German company, very large actually, all over European Union. It's the same problem. It's all legacy manufacturing. So a startup company which does not have the legacy always has an advantage. This is like Amazon against largest retailers, not only Sears, but Macy's or anybody. So they don't have to struggle with the legacy systems or capital investment, etc., which is a key problem. Uber will always win the game because Uber decides to start with the handheld device as opposed to a PC. And companies that grow up with a legacy system and a PC try to extend it to the cell phone, the code does not work as well. If you start with a cell phone, it's a very different way of coding everything for you. And cell phone is a very smart, smart terminal. It's a computer essentially in your hand. I can do more things with it. So Uber has all the advantages. So technology is a major disruptor. Second one is globalization. Last 30 years or so, since the first energy crisis, but in the 90s, we said basically domestic growth is not coming in most advanced countries. So we will open up for trade, multilateral trade, which is now changing with the new policy, new government in the US, and that allowed trade as a growth engine. I have a book on this one called Tectonic Shift, about how trade is the driver of growth globally. But that means global competition is at your doorstep. No more protectionism. Or it will be done by non-traditional competitors that you did not think could ever make the business. In our case, it would be more a privatization of the industry, if not the company, to say you can have a private sector compete with you in power generation. So you do have Tata power. You have uh, uh, Adani power, right? In Mundra, I went to Mundra, Kutch. The reason I went there is not because there's a power plant by these two companies, but that's my village I come from nearby, Kandakra. That's where I grew up, or my parents grew up, actually. It's fascinating. Today it's becoming a very exciting new place like Mundra Port. This is a new competition that's coming in. So how do you trade? So we underestimate competition. Usually we focus on our immediate competitor, if there is any which is very, again, a key change. And the third one is uh, uh, regulation, policy changes. And policy changes impacts this industry more, all regulated industries, like telecom or, or power, and that's the key problem. So we have to understand all those. So denial. Second one is arrogance. With success, we all become arrogant. And then the media praises us to a level where we think we are bigger than life. I found all entrepreneurs go through this mental morphous. Most of them succeeded just by being there. Opportunistic behavior. How many have seen a movie called Being There? Peter Sellers, one of those comedians, brilliant guy. Chauncey the gardener is cutting hedges in front of a house. He's a mumbler. He talks something. 
People think he's a wise man, so he becomes a wise man. Isn't that interesting? So it's very fascinating to understand arrogance gets to you quite a lot. Third one is complacency, and I'll go into each one of them in detail, and we'll talk about complacency. Basically, it says success breeds failure. Next one is much more interesting, competence dependence. I'm good at what I do, so I'm a top surgeon making knee replacement, but I cannot do anything other than knee replacement. And what knee replacement changes totally, either by regulation or by technology, I'm obsolete. So something that I created over hundreds of years as my competency is not there anymore. So in the power business, our worry is the following. Power generation will get distributed whether we like it or not. Just like computers used to have a CPU. Remember legacy 360, 370 IBM machines? Today my computing has been distributed into my PC, I can do it, and my cell phone now. No computer guy at IBM had ever thought about distributed computing. Fascinating. And there are many more examples. So today, and oxygen primarily, I've gone and visited them. All of the large server farm companies like Google, Microsoft, all have this Bloom company as their energy source. I have no transmission problems. It's all within the corporation. I don't have to rely on the public grid. I can pump excess capacity, fuel cell technology. And now, more interestingly, this whole uh, Tesla phenomenon. I can generate power in a battery and store it in a way which allows a lot more flexibility also, right? So we have to understand that generation itself may change, but more importantly, the distribution, which is our customer, they may change. Most importantly, end user may change. And we need to learn how end user change in a society impacts backwards. In India, I find the consumer is changing so dramatically. Today, the generation gap is less than eight years old in India after the 1991 reforms. The older sister is unable to relate to the younger sister if they're eight years apart, both in lifestyle, how you wear, what you show, and even in family values. Isn't that interesting? We had a very smooth generational transfer of values and socialization and consumption that is disconnected now. Today, the young uh, boy meets young girl in college. They decide they will get married, not necessarily parents. They want parents' blessings. And the first thing they want to do is not to live with the parents unless it's a necessity. You cannot find a housing, then it's a different story. They are used to their independence. In order for them to start their own household, both have to work. You cannot survive on a single income in a metro area anymore. So all, all of what changes is not, surprisingly, money, but time. They have no time. So today, people would rather have things delivered to them because they have no time to go to the store. Isn't that interesting? There was a lifelong multi-generational relationship with a neighborhood grocery store or a panwala kind of a stuff whose delivery boy will come take the order at the end of the day, they will deliver the order, etc. These young people have no relationship with that multi-generational uh, neighborhood merchant. They're too cosmopolite for that person. Isn't that interesting? They would like to shop in a major store, supermarket, or they would like to go on Flipkart and order it, or Amazon and order it in India. But the fastest growing market, surprisingly, for Amazon and Flipkart in India is in second, third tier cities, not even in the metro areas. So long as you put a supply chain in place and a delivery mechanism, these are the changes that are taking place. 
So power generation is going to change, whether we like it or not, and how do you accommodate that properly? So com co competency dependence, competitive myopia. Customer myopia, we always start marketing myopia, etc. But we narrow down who is our competitor over time. It's like a marathon race where every, there are 50,000 people running, good runners out distance, successful companies. Now they're watching two, three companies, and all of a sudden somebody comes from behind, nobody knows. As it happens in horse racing, or they call what they call the dark horse, essentially, in the process, and they take the victory lane. That's basically competitive myopia. Volume obsession, which is fascinating. We always have believed that greater the volume, lower the marginal cost, and therefore greater the cash flow or profitability. That theory is also thrown out now, so I'll talk about that one. And the last one is turf wars, which we all know. So I'll get into that stuff. So here is the journey. Let's start with the first one. Denial of new reality is probably the most prevalent bad habit of all good companies. As I mentioned, most companies succeed by being there. However, they create a cocoon of myth, ritual, and orthodoxy. It has happened with Indian successful entrepreneurs for your information. To enhance the company's success, it's just basically PR quite a lot. Denials of three new realities are most dangerous. Emerging disruptive technologies, Uberization of the world, Changing consumer taste, organic foods now is becoming the craze everywhere in the world, as opposed to traditional processed foods with more chemicals. So all the chemical companies that supply are finding they need to find some other markets. And non-traditional global competition where out of nowhere China and India have become global competitors. India in the IT services, I must tell you, 25 years ago nobody thought that's possible. At best, we could do Y2K, remember? Because we had the COBOL and Fortran capability. The world has abandoned those languages, by and large, to our newer things. And we got contracts. But today, Wipro, that I sat on the board for 19 years as an independent board member, we had never imagined crossing more than a billion dollars. And today, there are about 10 billion. TCS is even bigger. Infosys is a great success story. Five large companies now are competing head-to-head -head against IBM and Accenture and those guys, which is unthinkable at one time. So this is the new reality, right? So that's just yes. A company is in a denial stage. How do you know you are in a denial stage? The analog here is that it's like a medical doctor. The key expertise of a medical doctor is diagnosis, not a remedy. If you don't have the right diagnosis, you may prescribe things that never works. So the CEO or the leader of the organization must be like a good medical doctor. He sees the signs, vital signs in the body. By just watching the face, he or she can tell what's wrong with you and prescribes a medication, almost like a miracle drug, and it works. Very fast, surprisingly changed, very positively. So that's the analog here. Uh, if it's not invented here, it cannot be good. This happens typically with a pioneer company who pioneers a technology. So they're the brilliant people who design that product. And those laboratory guys believe very strongly there are no better people. And if I'm a very good laboratory, whether it's a kitchen laboratory, like a packaged goods company, uh, General Mills, General Foods in our case, or whether it's a manufacturing company like Siemens or... Uh, um, group Schneider, for example, I work for Group Schneider quite a lot, or for example, let's say General Electric. Best students want to work for them. At IIM Ahmedabad, it used to be Unilever at one time. You always wanted Unilever to be where you are. Best of the brightest. Today, they want to work for Mariko. Isn't that interesting change? So that R&D guys or corporations gain more and more, and now suddenly it does not work for them. They think they are the best, so they have a mental not invented here phenomenon. And if it uses rationalizers or excuses for its fundamental problems. To break the denial habit, what should you do? You must look at it, first of all, that there is a denial. 
I worked for about three major automobile companies in Detroit, General Motors, R&D center called the Tech Center. They thought Japanese can never make it in the automobile business. Even today, Germans are in a denial that Lexus is a better built car than a Mercedes-Benz or a BMW. Isn't that interesting? Because they are sold on the idea, we are so good, we are top brain power. And this is the key problem primarily. So let me move faster. Time-wise, please let me know. I don't know how to manage my time, so okay? And then we'll open up for questions and answers. So to break the denial habit, you must look for it, admit it, assess it, and change it. Think about the change that Satya Nadella has made in Microsoft. That was languishing. Whoever decided to have this young man come in, not with the traditional bias of Windows, but non-Windows mindset, and today you see stock market has gone three times in the five, six years, repositioning the company, so it's doable. Either you hire somebody internally or externally, it makes no difference. You take the other company around here, which is uh, still in denial stage, is Facebook. We worry about the Facebook. Management is in a denial stage, you know, pretty much. And the last one, of course, Coca-Cola, which is trying to get away from carbonated beverages. They have just hired a new CEO internally, but totally different. And he has publicly announced the traditional formula is not the future of Coca-Cola. They got away by expanding worldwide, going into China market, that's sustained. But worldwide, carbonated drinks is in a decline generally, which is a key future they're worrying about. So let me move next one. Oh, I'm sorry, did I do wrong something? Okay. Arrogance. Arrogance is an overblown self-image or superiority and self-importance. Alfred Sloan, who was the real architect of General Motors, which was the best corporation, actually made GM arrogant. What is good for GM was a phrase used is good for the nation in a public hearing, and that's the most arrogant statement you can make. The more successful you are, the more modest you should be, which is how the society will then respect you, treat you, enable you. And this is a key problem with many couple. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm mixing up. So arrogance is overblown. So companies can become arrogant when they do exceptional achievement. Tesla, I find the same problem now. Mark my words, we're going to go through a crisis. <laughs> it's very fascinating how it's a repeated phenomenon. They are the David against the Goliath. When a small company conquers a big giant, they become arrogant. They pioneer an altogether new product or service like Uber has done, which is surprisingly managing the change behind the scenes more positively, might survive. And they are generally smarter than the other guys. They simply are more brilliant people. This is the Silicon Valley success. But Silicon Valley will be replaced by Shenzhen Valley for your information. Silicon Valley still does not believe that Chinese can do it. You have to go to Shenzhen and see the kind of talent is out there which is as good or better than Silicon Valley. So they are going to suffer from that problem is our forecast. Third one, the warning signs of arrogance are when you stop listening, when you flaunt, and when you browbeat others. The best way to break the arrogance is to rotate management into new challenges. I'm in my comfort zone. I'm doing the best in my specialization. I'm a top, top marketing person. What if I ask to head an engineering department? I'm a good finance person. What if I'm asked to engage into marketing? If you rotate by functions, suddenly you become more modest because you don't know the discipline. You have to rely on the people. So that's what we recommend. Implement non-traditional succession. Uh, we did that at Whirlpool, David Whitworm, which was three levels below. And we moved the hierarchy up in the process retired out senior people. Diversify the talent pool. This is the hottest thing going right now to have a large corporation recruit people from all over the world rather than from the country where they're headquartered or where they began by and large. Encourage outside perspectives as much as you can, which is what you do in this particular learning academy that you have here. Uh, leadership programs, advanced management programs, send them to schools or universities where they will get a different or a wider perspective. And bring outside leadership at the top if necessary. And that's what IBM did as we talked about. Complacency. Complacency is a sense of comfort and security 
that past will continue indefinitely into the future. Taxi guys were very complacent. They've got a license. Today, most taxi guys in most <coughs> major areas in America are just idling. They don't know what to do. They're stuck with that medallion, as they call it. They have to pay the fees, and they don't have the revenue. Uber and Uber clones, like Lyft, etc., or Ola, in your case, are taking the market. Our baby bells, telephone companies, where I've worked quite a lot, all of them are gone today. It's very interesting. Now AT&T has come back, buy one of the baby bells, which is fascinating. Only two baby bells are surviving. In other words, success breeds failure. Complacency arises when a company's past success is due to its regulated monopoly position, consistent for pattern, or its distribution monopoly, manufacturing monopoly, or distribution monopoly, and when the government owns or controls the company. That's a typical forecast that we have. So how do you change this? The warning signs of complacency are when you are in no hurry to make decisions. So you measure the speed, the urgency of making decisions. Your processes are overly bureaucratic, and you have a bottom-up consensus-based culture. So in my advising of large corporations, I found three things you cannot do bottom-up. First one is an IT architecture. Everybody has an opinion, right? So IT architecture has to be top-down. Vision is the other one. And third one is branding. If you want to change the brand, don't ask opinion from everybody. Because people will have very good opinions. So those three things we basically say is almost top-down approach rather than a bottom-up consensus. So in cultures like the baby bells, the telephone cultures, changing brand name has been a very battleground. What do you call them after they are no longer baby bells, right? So that's a very interesting idea. The best ways to break the complacency habits are re-engineer the company. Basically, break up Kraft Foods has gone through breakup. Remember Mandalay's and all that? DuPont, Dow merger, now they're breaking up back again. Bunch of examples are out there. Right now, they're struggling quite a lot. Reorganize it. Geographic, vertical, or product line. Reorganization brings about a change. <laughs> Divest non-core businesses. Very common practice worldwide. Divest small brands. Procter & Gamble has done. Focus on a few brands, if that's what you want to do, or outsource non-core businesses, whatever they are. So IT services, real estate, etc. companies tend to outsource it, give it to somebody else. Competency dependence. When the core competency or the DNA of the company becomes a liability, it results in competency dependence. It is what I refer to as the curse of incumbency. It limits the vision like the Mao Tung's frog in the bottom of the well. World is fine. It limits the vision. Classic examples of competency dependence are Singer sewing machines. Remember, they were the dominant ones at one time, but people don't do sewing anymore or do it in an emergency or a hobby. Classic examples of competency dependence are sewing machines, singer. A&P, which was private brand label, branded products came in and they would not pay attention to that. They're a great supermarket. Marks and Spencer is surviving outside of England where they began, and more recently Sears Roebuck. More competitive examples include Xerox is going through a midlife crisis. Kodak is already gone. And DuPont is what we are watching right now, what will happen to the DuPont's reincarnation, transformation, where they will go. Uh, the warning signs of competency dependence are company's inability to transform itself. Coca-Cola is struggling with that. Prevalence of malaise and inevitability. I just surrender whatever happens, happens kind of an attitude rather than saying I take charge. General Electric is absolutely going through that right now and when the stakeholders are jumping the ship. This is my worry about Facebook right now, because many stakeholders of Facebook are simply saying they are just not listening to anybody, 
Have you seen all the management has left? WhatsApp group they bought? Every one of the, this, is, I, this is not the company I sold it for, and I just, I'm just not happy. They're even taking millions of dollars of penalty for quitting early, which is fascinating, so we are watching that thing. The best way to break the competency dependence habit is to search for new applications and new markets. Uh, go global is one strategy. Goodrich Corporation was a tire company. Today it is a specialty military company doing very, very well. It was then bought out by one of the, uh, I think, United Technologies, which is making Raytheon play. Now you can see all the change taking place in the defense industry. Also moving downstream or upstream, healthcare is doing it. Developing altogether new competency, biogenetics, pharma companies are all saying future is no longer pharma, but will be biotechnology. And refocusing resources on a global basis. Uh, this is what Adida Birla Group has done. Carbon Black, they bought a company in Atlanta again in the US and in China. They are the largest carbon black company in the world actually now, which is interesting journey they are going through. Comparative myopia refers to the natural tendency of a company to narrow down the focus to one or two direct competitors. Uh, this tendency is partly because of a consequence of natural evolution of industry. Uh, we have a very successful book called The Rule of Three. All industries through shake out merger as they grow mature, three big players survive, others die, and the niche players do very well. So there's always global rule of three now taking place. I'm revising the book about global rule of three and which are the survivors across industries. But also because of the co-location of major competitors in two clusters. I found fascinating while well, people like Michael Porter will advocate cluster theory, which makes sense, a zone, because all the special like Silicon Valley as a zone, but they all think the same. New York capital market. All of those investment bankers think the same. So when you're located in the same place, you become more myopic. Opposite of what we think from an academic viewpoint, which is fascinating. So how do you break this habit? There are several ways to break the habit of competitive myopia. Redefining the competitive landscape. There's an excellent book called Blue Ocean Strategy. Broadening the product or market scope. Lots of products have more capabilities direct to consumer market in pharma or in television, etc., through cable, fascinating. E-commerce is going direct to the consumer. Becoming an industry consolidator, buy out everybody else to get the scale and the economies of scale. United Technologies, I just mentioned, AT&T the same way. Counterattacking non-traditional competitors. In airlines, they have started budget airlines. So Singapore Airlines is very good, but they want to keep high prices. You have Silk. They just built a Terminal 4 for those low, fair, like indigo type companies, which is what they are saying. There's a market. We'll divide the market, essentially, and refocusing on the core business. Adida Birla Group went through huge diversification. Most of them did not succeed except, I think, the idea, which is a cellular telephone. They decided other than that, they will be back to their core business and do better on a global basis, essentially. So that's the competitive myopia. Volume obsession. A company acquires the bad habit of volume obsession when it is the pioneer of a high margin business and margins collapse, so they think they will make it up in volume. Typical thinking. Levi's did that thing in the worst way possible. High margin expensive genes from super premium position to grow the business. They have sold it to J.C. Penney, who is a mass retailer or a Walmart. First year, the contract is fantastic because you get such a huge demand at a lower price. So they build factories now to cope up with the demand. Think typical strategic planning, operational planning. Next year, the J.C. Penney buyer says reduce price even more. So now you have the volume but no margin. The margins are collapsing. So how do you make up for the margin? You cut the cost. So you buy buttons which are not as good. Thread is not as good. Denim you buy from a country whose quality assurance is not that good. Now you become a cheap brand. 
compared to a brand that lasts forever. That jeans were designed for the farmer and the cowboy, became a fashion item. That's fascinating again, right? And it has a false understanding and matrix about economies of scale. In my research, I find that we are focused on economies of scale because of the industrial age on what we do in our factory. We add labor, we add capital, and we add uh, land, you know, buildings. However, if you take all of the industries, the biggest economies of scale is not what you do, but how do you get smart procurement? Procurement, even today, is about 40 to 50% of your total cost. Manufacturing today, all over the world, labor cost is under 10%. Capital cost is definitely now under average cost of capital is under 10%, not in India, but worldwide, which is interesting. So it's less than 20, 25% together. With more automation, everything, labor cost has been declining in manufacturing. And the cost of components is much higher. Here is the irony. So IBM has to exit the PC business because they can't make money with their brand name assembly because the cost of manufacturing, they have 11% margin only value add. 89% is all procurement, out of which 79% goes to two companies, Microsoft and Intel, who are laughing all the way to the bank. Upstreaming supplier is making money with a committed customer who has no choice. Are you with me? And you are losing money. So all the traditional thinking about branding power, etc., is out of the business now. The raw material guys have more power today, in your case, whoever provides you the equipment, the components, etc. Or if you are buying raw material energy from someplace, they have more power than the retailer, the, many, uh, the people who do the work, which is, again, very different way of thinking. So that's the key change. Our automobile industry is finding the same thing. At the assembly level, you're making less money than at the component level. Our retailers are finding the same thing, and franchise businesses are finding the same thing. Our volume obsession, it accumulates future obligations, such as employee retirement, health care plans, which are unsustainable. In volume theory, you expand quite a lot. In the US, you have to give obligations after retirement in terms of uh, medical service. So General Motors on expansion volume idea thought that one retiree will be funded by nine new factory workers today with robotics and everything. For seven, eight retirees of GM, there's only one new worker who contributes toward the pension plan. The game is over. You have to go for Chapter 11 bankruptcy to forego all of those obligations. Airlines have done the same thing. They intentionally declared Chapter 11 to remove all contracts with employees, for example, just to survive. So this is a problem with volume obsession. It's non-operating costs, not the operating margin, but non-operating margin, which is three components, cost of capital, taxes, if you are paying corporate taxes, and dividends. So this is where Silicon Valley guys are masters. They pay no corporate tax. Corporate tax is even with reduction now about 25, 28%. Under Reagan administration was 55%, which means whatever margin generates cash flow is all going to pay others, not investing back into the company. And of course, the dividends is the last area becomes expensive. So we invented a technique you might remember called EV economic value added. I did a lot of work on that one for Lucent, the telephone manufacturer, Western Electric, like a Nortel. And we, have, we found lots and lots of inefficiencies because you're looking at the whole thing with a different lens now. Or activity-based costing is the latest one that I use quite a lot because it gives you a false, the current accounting system gives you a false perspective whether you are profitable or not. So you put a different lens, which is interesting. So I'll just take the volume obsession. How do you remind? Align cost with revenues. This is the key, 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 key mechanism, activity-based costing. Convert cost centers into revenue centers. So inbound calling centers at Whirlpool we made into revenue center. 
Because we found most of the calls have nothing to do with complaints or praise. By the way, praise was 90%, complaint was 10%. If there were, most of them were inquiries. How do I fix my washer? Where can I get a compressor part? People do quite a lot on their own. Or a contractor calls up. Because the document was very poorly written by somebody in the manufacturing. So parts, if they are defective, when they come back, for example, the parts department has to pay. This became an information source, and we basically asked departments to pay for this information. So from cost center, how do you make it into a revenue center? Ultimately, a profit center. It's all doable. Decentralized PNL. As you aggregate the PNL from the top, you are having a lot of cross subsidies between SKUs, product lines, services. You begin to decentralize as much as possible. Then you begin to see the alignment of the margins, revenues, and the cost structure. Target costing is a technique Japanese invented again. Japanese are pioneers of many techniques. Six Sigma, for example, Kanban, this is one of them. So we use target costing as a mechanism, which is not cost plus accounting, but price minus accounting. Presuming price will be at this thing, how do you reduce your cost over time as a mechanism? And I find fascinating, most people would love to be world-class marketers. So customer friendly, customer satisfaction, customer delight, you know. Uh, and now we use, of course, the net promoter score and all the stuff. But the procurement department is really backward. A lot of favoritism they want, a lot of corruption even. So we try to look at that area to say, how can we manage that? Uh, so become a world-class customer. Your suppliers actually will generate more margin for you than you will be able to do. If you treat them with respect, invest in them, etc., which is a radical thought, but it works apparently in companies. Last one, very quickly, and then I will summarize and open up for questions and answers. I'm slightly, time-wise, I'm okay? Okay, fine, we're good. The root cause of turf wars, this is internal battle. I find fascinating. Every company starts when they start are small, mostly functionally organized, and they build a 50-story building. This is the management building, mentally. There's a tower A called engineering. There's a tower B called manufacturing or making. Tower C, sales, marketing. Tower D, customer support. Just think about four towers. There's only one common lobby at the 50th floor. Senior executives can cross over from one tower to the other. Usually they meet in a washroom. They're bumping into each other. At the bottom level, there is a common lobby. But if I'm on the fourth floor and want to meet somebody else, I'm engineering, I want to meet manufacturing on the fourth floor, what do I have to do? Either go down the lobby and then come back, or I go up, which is my boss's approval. There are times in the year where the elevator seems to only go up, never comes down which is the budgeting time. On the 50th floor, the senior executives are fighting for their share of the budget, both operating budget and capital. They have no time for anybody else. So you go down to the lobby and say, let's informally got bureaucracy be damned, you and I can work together. But if your boss catches that, your job is at danger. You can be fired in a private sector. So management understands this. So you build a bridge between tower and a tower B, tower C, or whatever it is. That's called a task force. Have you heard of a task force? <laughs> now I'm in a task force, a team across functions. And I come from the engineering. I see a person from the sales and marketing and immediately say, just as I thought, the guy is so slick. Have you seen how dapper he's dressed? I can't trust him. He will oversell. I got to do delivery of that. The sales guy looks at engineer and says, just as I thought, the nerd. He's having a sneakers on a suit. If I were to take him to the customer, 
I have to clean him up first, right? Isn't that interesting? I find cultural differences across nations or within a nation like us across ethnic groups is a lot less than functional loyalty and cultures. If I'm an engineer, I'm, I'm an engineer at heart, period. If I'm a sales guy, I'm a sales guy. It's more ideology, more religion than I've ever seen. And that is how we have the turf fights. So how do you avoid that? How do you make sure that we have to work in a cross-functional way? Because value creation or value add is not just in your hands, but everybody's hands kind of a thing. I found very fascinating. I used to work in telephone companies as an advisor, large AT&T. I would fly in from California to New York, New Jersey. And I would expect product teams. I was expecting five, six people. Fifty people will show up. So I said, this is not a product team, this is a product crowd. Why are you all here? Each one of them was sent by their boss to make sure their interests are served or they boycott it. Sounds familiar? That often makes the organization take all of its talent and resource, fight inward rather than fight external competition or be customer-centric, etc. So this is the turf war. So turf wars arise due to organizational design, the way we are organized. If you are a product division, there will be turf fights from product perspective. If you are a functional division, which is the loyalty to our disciplines, or if you are a geographic thing, and a typical those three things always are in conflict. So we often put a matrix management. Have you seen that? You know, I have the functional here, and I have the product over there, right? And I have a sort of a problem in matrix management is that it's only temporary bridge. Permanently, nobody reports to anybody. We found that does not work very well. So it's very fascinating. So organizational design. How are your business units versus product divisions? If it's product divisions, do you go global? Same product manager is responsible, or do you have a country heads? We found country heads is very fascinating. They're like mini czars in that country, like typical king or a noble, has to have an entourage, a support staff, very expensive. Most of them are public relations people, external affairs. They know the governments very well. They know how to manage the cultural and the geographic you know, aspects. <coughs> And they're not as useful, and they're actually a problem because they're gatekeepers for the product guy. He thinks there is a market. The country manager says, I don't want to help you. Typical pattern. So how do you reorganize? So HP reorganized completely, where the country managers were subordinated more as a support function rather than as a PL responsibility. It's a PL aspect that becomes very key. That's what happens. When the company is dominated by a single functional culture, so this is the work I did at Motorola quite a lot. It's an engineering company. And if you're not an engineer, you're not respected. And most engineers don't want to do selling function. Because they grew up with the aptitude. They went into engineering because they don't believe in sales. So now sales guys who come from economics, business degrees have no internal respect. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> so we try very hard what to do. So if you are an engineering-oriented company, make sure engineers rise to other functions, which we do very well in India, I must tell you, by rotating them, etc., etc. So that's clearly one area. Engineering, similarly, some companies have sales culture. <laughs> IBM is a sales culture, clearly, not a marketing culture. In my telephone company experience, there was no marketing department. They don't need one. It's a monopoly. Why should you have marketing? Public relations, yes. Community relationship, government relationship, but not traditional uh, customer-oriented marketing. Uh, when the company is dominated by a single function, and when there's a poor post-merger integration. Most companies, when they buy lateral companies, they cannot integrate the cultures. HP, Compaq was a disaster. Most of them are disastrous. Banks, some of them are able to integrate well. We are watching right now integration between DuPont and Dow, for example. 
uh, and merger acquisitions is the future more and more in organic growth. So that's very fascinating. That's what we do. So hospitality, uh, hospital groups are going through in America right now, and hospitality. Marriott, remember merge with Starwood, these are two big chains. Theirs have gone relatively smoothly, I'm told, in terms of people exchange, the computers and all that stuff by and large. So, to break the habit of territorial impulse, it's important to invest in internal marketing. Most companies don't do enough internal marketing. They do external marketing. That's one clearly. To push management out of their ivory towers. So in one of the large telephone companies, people on the 50th floor, we said you can be in that office less than one third of the total time. Other two thirds you go out in the field, customer or employees. You will see the real world because as a senior chairman of the company, I come through a dedicated car, I go up to my office, some of them go early to exercise and all the stuff. They are ready. Everybody comes to them. They all have an agenda in their mind. So what you get at the senior level is a filtered information, not the real world. So it succeeded very well because you, have, you, 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 have a, you wake up. You have no idea what's happening in the real world till you go and visit the real world. So nowadays... CEO's job is mostly chief marketing officer, chief company or a brand ambassador with large key accounts primarily. IBM, that's what they do now. That's very change, big change. That's what they do. Uh, to push management out of their ivory tower, to reorganize around customers or products, 3M company has done it, to automate and integrate functions. This is the hottest area is digital transformation of corporations. Because digital is like breathing air, it's everywhere. So how do you put that digital technology as a way of bringing about a transformation of the organization, not the old culture theory, you see. It's the technology theory of transformation, which is gaining a lot of popularity. And to rotate leadership across functions and geographies, best people do is the diplomatic core. You're always put into a strange territory. You have to learn how to cope with it. So I've done that for a couple of large infrastructure companies like ABB type, where we said, in India, put a Korean in charge of Indian market. He will be totally in a new place. Does not know the language. There are no friends. He will rely, therefore, on the corporation more to survive. There's no local loyalty. Put an Indian in Ghana or something like that. Diplomats always do that thing. Every three years, and then they come back, and et cetera. They have a huge immersion program. So I like the diplomatic model around here that if you can do in corporations, that will work very well. So here are the 10 back again. And I just want to like to summarize all good companies on their way to success acquire one or more of these seven bad habits. And those are the seven that are listed. In this presentation, I have discussed how each habit is acquired by good or great companies. What are the warning signals you should look for and how to break that habit? Ultimately, it's all about leadership. The job of the leader is to constantly monitor the company's health, culture, whatever word you would like, and prevent it from learning bad habits in the first place. However, if a bad habit is discovered, it should be promptly addressed. The best cure for bad habit is no cure at all. It is to prevent the company from acquiring the bad habit. And there's a question. This book has done so well, all the reporters said, all right, Stephen Covey wrote a book called The Eighth Habit, remember? And he asked me a question, what's the eighth habit? I had no answer. I said, give me some time. Let me bring my knowledge together, do research. And I did discover the eighth bad habit of all great companies. What is it? What do you think it is? Anybody? Not reading this book. Not reading this book, no. <laughs> that, what do you think? It's, it's absolutely a in, very insightful discovery. Every good company plateaus the potential of their best people. 
you hire the brightest, and then you make them mediocre in the company. Isn't that uncanny? I mean, it's just incredible. What a waste. So plateauing the potential of your own people is the worst habit good companies do, and that's why they fail. So that's my passion now to study what can companies do when you hire somebody. And by the way, in my knowledge about HR side, I've done a lot of work. I find the biggest mistake we make is in selection. And we think we'll make it up in training. Selection is the most important one. In my work on empowerment, frontline people empowerment, which is very important because those are the touch points with all the stakeholders. One third of the people don't want to be empowered. They don't like to make decisions and take risk. One third of the people are incompetent. You cannot empower because they will make mistakes. <coughs> Only one third of the people are willing and able to be empowered, right? Isn't that interesting? So I began to do research in HR. Mostly selection is the biggest issue. And that is why top universities do very well because the selection is good. It's whether it's IIT or with you know whatever the institutions are, IIMs or counterpart of IIMs, their raw material is so good. So it does not matter whether you have a best library or the best teachers. So long as those teachers and library just nurture them, because these are great rough diamonds that I can polish and get the brilliance out. That's what it takes. So selection is very important that we need to think about pretty much. So let me stop here and thank you. We have time for questions. Thank you so much, Professor. That was an extremely enriching session. Oh. But now that we have uh, you with us today, we cannot just let you go without this audience um, asking you questions just in case you have. So the house is open to question and answers. In case you have questions, this is the opportunity. You make the most of it. I don't think you'll get such an opportunity ever again. You could raise your hands, and we have a team, a volunteer team here who would carry the mic to you. Please raise your hands if you have questions to the professor or on the topic or anything that you want to share with us. Yes, could you also tell us your name, please, before asking the question? Uh, good. good morning, sir. Uh, this is Ishwar from NTP School of Business. Uh, sir, uh, you told about volume obsession. Uh, if you acquire the more, uh, more uh, another companies like uh, ex excess of volume, it would uh, lead to uh, margins, lower yeah. the margins might be. But uh, would it be true for the backward or forward integration for, the, for a company in a different business line? Yeah. So that if you go for backward integration, yeah. it would help to get better raw materials, you said, like that. Yeah. Generally, the best way to increase the volume and maintain margin is to focus not what you do, but your suppliers, what they do. And how do you get the efficiency of buying, primarily procurement? Because that's about 50% of the cost, generally. Uh, way back in the 60s, 63, 64, I got exposure to steel industry because I was in Pittsburgh, which was a steel capital. You know, what, what is now um, uh, all the three major steel companies. I remember in one of them, the senior most vice president was procurement chief officer. And he said our cost of material in the steel business is about 70% is all raw material. Which is value add you do very little. We focus too much about our people, our manufacturing, our processes when the value add is outside. This is where Apple excels. Apple is able to maintain its margin with volume because the suppliers are so efficient. Whether those are in fact uh, you know, um, Foxconn, which is a big supplier for them, for some of the component makers, for example. And with volume, they're able to get their cost down, which is the main thing. They're helping them quite a lot. Every retailer knows that the cost of goods sold is at least 50%, sometimes 60%. So they're very good buyers who are either nurturing a supplier or actually shopping around better, depending upon the product category, etc. 
So to me, backward integration works. Uh, but the problem in integration is very different. In my research on vertical integrations of an industry, let's say paper mills. So my backward integration would be trees, forestry, where I get my raw material, which is not as capital intensive, mostly labor in many ways. Nature has given you the cost of cutting. Then I have a paper mill where I make it into a pulp. And then from pulp I make a tissue, towel, you know, whatever I do, clothing, whatever I do. If my, in a vertical integration, if my capital is very intensive at one stage in the value creation, and not so, it is not sustainable. Keep that in the back of your mind. Vertical integration does not work. The capital intensive part, like refinery in oil business, will be the bottleneck. Building new refineries takes time. So often what you have to do is to create horizontal integrations rather than vertical integrations. So that's the key thing that I've learned. Or make everything working capital. So if you take Uber, which I'm studying from an accounting costing viewpoint, Uber has very, very limited fixed capital. Automobile is on a lease. Most car makers would love to give that car on a lease for three years. So they amortize over one and a half years. Drivers are all variable cost. If they earn, they get money. Are you with me? My cost is management cost has to be. It's a very thin capital organization, you know, uh, asset light as we call it, which is the key advantage of silicon services companies. They're all very asset light, whereas power generation, steel mills, <laughs> locomotives are very asset heavy. The problem with asset heavy is that unless you make better turns of that asset, so I measure efficiency by dividing my denomination would be the asset value with revenue at the top. How many turns I'm making that asset? Faster the turns I make, the more profitable I will be primarily. So it's a very different way of looking at the world. I find I find fascinating. I like to do balance sheets. So here is a slightly different answer, and this is my problem. I give longer answers for short questions. This is the work for Texas Instruments, highest level. I looked. I like to look at balance sheets, not the uh, income statement. And in the balance sheet, there was a six hundred million dollar line item R and D budget. And I said, is this a cost center or a revenue center? Oh, no, they said it generates royalty. I said, how much? $1.4 billion. So the question is, why are you in manufacturing? So not a single manufacturing plant could deliver the technology return, which usually we think we invent the technology, we manufacture, make it, we sell it, we service it, right? Typical Siemens model typical old IBM model, and this jolted the company. The chairman simply said, you are right. And if you manufacture, you have environmental issues nowadays, labor issues, country disputes because manufacturing is global. So we shut down all manufacturing plants except engineering calculators. That was a standalone business. And we bet on one manufacturing, which was a DSP chip. I do a lot of work in the Silicon Valley industries. My view was that this PC business, where you get the volumes more so than, let's say, the legacy system, big computers, more volume than PC will be the handheld devices, cellular telephone. Nokia was the largest one. Nokia was our key customer. And DSP chips have survived so far. The company is basically a technology company making royalty income. IBM still makes money on PC after exiting because you still have to pay for OS2 architecture. Google is very smart. The day they created Android, they simply say that we will give it to the world. They make money on every sale of any cell phone on Android platform as a royalty. This is the thinking, new thinking in the digital age as opposed to the industrial age. Next question. Yes. So, 
please tell you tell us your name also oh. okay. yeah, ask a question and maybe mother. the function or area because that may contextualize better good afternoon sir my name is teja so my question is related to the fourth bad habit that you have mentioned yes. uh, that is competence dependence yes so sir my question is do you think the diversity option that a company is looking for should justify the core business of the company or can it be an entirely new business vertical uh it's very very challenging the way it, it, first of all it's your survival game or a transformation game where you are versus where you need to be right so if you are a hardware maker in digital technology how can you become a software company which is a key difference <laughs> and if you are a software company how can you make hardware right? even today the two disciplines have not converged computer science is math mathematics guys driven algorithms uh the hardware is driven by electronics uh as opposed to electrical uh engineering departments and they don't talk to each other so how do you do that transition right apple is going through that right now from a product company to services company if you are a manufacturer of products that's a typical evolution because when you have a large install base like siemens for example or general electric in power generation business you have a lot of downstreaming value in service so ge bought about 103 companies all services created a whole division ge services about 20 billion or something pretty large has a way of transitioning out because they may not be able to sell as many generators because of the politics whatever the reasons are i mean we are struggling right now because of our government policies so other countries are retaliating by not buying capital goods boeing aircraft sounds familiar <laughs> all the contracts are going to airbus because of the dispute that we have right now with the world in trade so those things are the ones where you say if there's a permanent change we will diversify that's very possible the one thing that some companies have tried to do is to let's run the core business more efficiently and then cash flow coming it out of that one invest into all together new but completely separate division all together xerox tried that xerox park was located in california not in rochester very far they invented the technology that apple uses basically gui you know the inter interface uh, uh user interface for example display quite a lot came but they still could not make the transition it's hard it's just generally hard but that's the ultimate game you can have to play or you make acquisitions coca cola has made acquisitions of many non carbonated brand names and they're saying that we are basically in a distribution business not in product branding business and once that comes as a light bulb then you can do everything so now if you are a distribution company as opposed to a manufacturing company your competency is to reach the customers through shipment and everything better than anybody else and you can distribute anybody's product now you know that would be the logic here okay thank you thank you so much uh, we are slightly bound by time and can take probably one last question so let's keep this one as the last hello uh, hello sir uh, my name is tarun from ntpc school of business oh, oh. Uh, my question is uh, india is mostly dominated by coal based power plants yes. so now uh, most globally uh, renewables uh, uh, energy is focused so yes. what what should the uh, coal based generation plants should uh, make uh, yeah. uh, use of this fi fixed assets when well, excellent point when your asset becomes what we call in regular a stranded asset the best stranded asset example in india is textile mills way back when look what happened to those real estate values they don't make textiles anymore but certainly they are making something else which won't work as well in your case because generation is a tough business okay so i can tell you coal based coal you know thermal power that you create there are three four options one is to make sure that coal that you use is better quality coal 
but the environmental damage, which is where the risk you are taking, will not happen. In one of the electrical <coughs> distribution countries with power generation, but coal fired, we found that the condensing towers has a lot of heat. What if that heat, rather than recycle, can be distributed as a field nearby, <coughs> land wise? They own the land and make that into hydroponic agricultural things. It's too small, it's like tail wagging the dog, you know, that didn't work. The best in your case, unfortunately, as a generation business, you are stuck with it. So short term, you have to get rid of that capacity. What you generate, you can't store it. Unless you figure out a storage mechanism temporarily. So you have to go into the grid. You have to figure out how the government will allow you to sell outside of the territories. In fact, in telephone company, the same thing. A switch is a switch. If you don't use it now, it's gone. So we actually created a wholesale division. You sell to your competitor. Now, right now in India, the economy is not doing to the level of the capacity buildup that we have done, right? I mean, you are alone, 50 mega, 50,000 megawatts, planning to be 130,000 or something. And now we have the Tatas doing the same thing, you know, and the Adani is thinking the same way. So there will be excess capacity in the short run till the demand catches up now. And then the demand may shift or the capacity may shift from coal-based to gas-fired plant. So we are doing because we are regulated digitally but privately held. We get the government approval for rate changes. Taxpayer has to pay for the revitalization. Convert the plant from a coal-fired to actually gas-fired. Now you have a gas problem in I know, Gale and your relationship and right now. But gas is the way out right now in the US at least we find. Plenty of gas, relatively inexpensive. And the cost of converting the capital, the plant itself, it seems to be working. So we are trying a bunch of ways right now there. Ultimately, the strategy would be as a stranded asset, as we call it, how do you exit it? So in the US, we used to have a vertical integration, power generation, power distribution, and the retail part. Uh, now we have decided that basically we need to divide, as you have done. Generation is a standalone business. And now you consolidate as many power plants as possible. As the Danis are trying to do, source coal outside the country, because they can't own coal mines anymore here. So you have to think out of the box and say, what can we do? As I said, your biggest solution may be, there are two. One is your, your coal procurement has to be from mines, not necessarily your mines that you own right now. That vertical integration may not work very well. And how do you manage that? How do you separate those assets? At least into two subsidiaries of some sort, right? The other side is to really improve the R&D. Uh, there are many universities working on this one where they know how to make coal better, especially ash that it produces, you know, pretty much. So how do you reduce that content to be environmentally compliant primarily? Our government has decided it's so oppressive a measure. Coal is a major oil gener or energy generating for us. And therefore, Trump administration has basically said we will relax let the coal mines come in. EPA regulations will be lower, which is a more like a policy lobby change. So, but I think the ultimate asset is uh, the land. Ultimate asset is not power generation, physical plant, but the expertise of building the plant, running the plants, as Indian railways have done very well through their consultancy arm in other countries. And we are very good engineers. Never anybody tell that you are not world class. We have surprised the world how good we are. And I'm very proud because I'm an Indian. At Whirlpool, we could not get the license here, money. This is Gandhi's emergency law. They had no dollars to pay. So with TVS, we negotiated 100 years of engineering talent as a payment. 
to allow them to make it here. Those engineers came. They look like typically ordinary people. Best mechanical engineering, industrial engineering is Purdue University. Most of the Whirlpool engineers are from Purdue University, like Bitspilani or IIT or something like that. They're the best in class. Even today, Purdue is dominant. And they thought they are the best engineers till Indian engineers <coughs> began to work and came out with a washing machine, which is more energy efficient, energy interrupted, because in India, you're used to power cuts more water efficient, and would you believe those top engineers from top universities in America began to have an enormous respect and admiration for Indian engineers? Not just Silicon Valley, it's everywhere. And largest pool of talent in this country in the engineering is in the public sector. We have done very well in managing railways outside the country, Indian railways. I can go on giving examples. So my view is that I think sometimes what you have to say is that it's not the physical asset, but my human asset that will provide additional revenue someplace, you know, through consultancy services. I know you have a consultancy arm. You are building things in other countries or nearby or far away, wherever you can do. So there are ways out pretty much, but it is a stranded asset. Your book value is more than its market value, I can assure you. It's a typical problem. I do a lot of work in that area personally. In fact, uh, down the road, I may, through you, send the key problem with the digital age. One of the disruptors of digital age is that old assets will become stranded assets. And therefore, all the values of the corporations are inflated, which is why if you take the S&P 500 today, the top companies are no longer General Electric, Westinghouse, they're all five IT companies. So these guys have stranded assets. And the, I don't know if you study finance or not, but there's a Tobin's Q. <laughs> I'm very much into finance and accounting and all that. I find fascinating Tobin's Q was a good market value versus book value. That ratio says premium you are commanding. Uh, today it's just the opposite. Your market value is lower than your asset. You have not depreciated fast enough on your books. And you caught yourself now. First thing I worked on that one was NTT in Japan in the 60s, 70s. The biggest value for the telephone company was the land. So why do I have my switch there? I don't need a, you know, exchange here physically. Can I convert into a sky rise? It worked for them trillions of dollars of asset value because land had appreciated. It's like textile mills, but much bigger numbers, interestingly. I have no other answer right now. Anything else? Last question, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Professor. It was indeed a very enthralling session. Thank you. Full of real life examples, industry case studies, the stories of success and failures of brands. How simply Professor Jigdeesh Shet uncovers the seven most self-destructive habits of good companies. He talked about denial, arrogance, complacency, competency dependence, competitive myopia, volume obsession, and territorial impulse, or what he calls it as turf wars. And also he told us about the ways to break these habits in simple and ordinary ways. If you chance upon his book, Professor Shade writes, the leader who embraces change will not only shake his company out of yesteryear's self-destructive habits, but will also escape the shackles of tomorrow's. NTPC is not only prudent, but driven by strong leadership and a very strong vision. Together, we will not just survive, but we will also fly high. With this, I would really like to request uh, Rao sir and Sena sir from the uh, stations. you to kindly come up on stage and present a token of gratitude on behalf of NTPC to Professor Shade. I cannot resist myself from saying this, that uh, we are particularly mesmerized by his passion for the subject marketing and his profession. At the age of 80, he's been standing for over two hours and speaking to us despite a very tightly packed schedule in India. I wonder how many of us would have this diligence and this enthusiasm when we age.
So this is a small token of gratitude from our side, sir. We wish that uh, this small memento reminds you of us. So back in Georgia, it would remind you of us. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we, we, I was saying that uh, we hope that this memento reminds you of us when you're back in Georgia. <laughs> With this, we have to bring the eminent se speaker series session to an end. Thank you so much, each one of you who is sitting in the audience. Thank you to the senior management whose continuous support has been with us uh, to, uh, for events like these. A big thank you to all the employees of NTPC who have joined us from remote locations across video conferencing. Um, we have a small lunch outside together. Let's uh, proceed towards the lobby. Until we meet next time in the next episode of Eminent Speaker Series, take care. Goodbye.